Hannah Clark's early life was marked by so many amazing achievements and passionate endeavors. She was going to make something amazing out of her life until she met her husband, a man who truly went out of his way to make his wife as miserable as possible, who wanted to exert the most control possible until he took everything away from her in his last violent, horrific act of control. But before we get into this horrifying case, I want to take a moment to tell you all about one of my favorite brands of coffee, Criminal Coffee. You know what's even better than coffee? Coffee with a cause. Criminal Coffee was created by the hosts of the Crime Weekly podcast, Stephanie Harlow and Derek Lavasser. After discovering so many cases that aren't fully investigated because of lack of funding, they decided to take action, and that is where Criminal Coffee comes in. When you buy Criminal Coffee, you are not only supporting a great cause, but you are going to be blown away from the quality. When you buy coffee from the store, it may have been sitting there for a month or two before the coffee ends up on the shelves. But with Criminal Coffee, once the beans arrive, they are roasted, nitrogen sealed, and shipped right away to your doorstep, ensuring the best tasting, freshest coffee possible. They offer a light, medium, or dark roast, as well as a decaf. It comes in ground, whole bean, and K-cups, so however you brew your coffee, they've got you covered. If you enjoy true crime, then you are going to love Criminal Coffee. Their bags are true crime themed with different characters who each have their own unique stories and are investigating their own crimes, so you can read up on what is happening with each of those characters' cases. Beyond that, Criminal Coffee is helping to solve real-life cases. A portion of the profits from every bag or box sold goes directly toward solving cold cases using the latest DNA technology. They have already raised over $15,000 and were able to get their first case funded. The first case was such a great start. It was actually a Jane Doe case with investigators thinking that the victim was a woman for over 50 years. But after Criminal Coffee got involved and helped fund the DNA testing, they not only realized that the victim was a man, but they were able to figure out who the victim was. They found his living relatives, who now have the answers that they've been looking for for all these years. What an amazing start to their fundraising efforts. So if you want delicious high-end coffee delivered right to your door while also supporting a great cause, head over to criminalcoffeeco.com and use code RACHEL10 for 10% off of your order. Once again, that's criminalcoffeeco.com using code RACHEL10 for 10% off your order. Thank you again so much to Criminal Coffee for getting me caffeinated for this video and for partnering with me on today's video. Okay, with that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the horrific murders of Hannah Clark and her three children. Hannah Clark was born to parents Susanna and Lloyd Clark on September 8th, 1988 in Brisbane, Australia, and she had one younger brother. Hannah was known as being very athletic all throughout her life, representing her high school at the state competition for trampoline when she was 16 years old. After graduating, she went on to coach trampoline classes, eventually teaching kindy gym at PCYC in Carindale. At the same time, she started working as a teacher in vacation care. For those of you who don't know, because I certainly didn't, vacation care is where children will go when they have breaks from school, but their parents can't just take time off to be at home with them all the time. So those kids get sent to vacation care. Those who knew Hannah described her as being fun-loving, happy, friendly, and bubbly. She was resilient, strong, and passionate about everything in her life. Everyone who knew her loved being around her due to her infectious smile and loving personality. Even as an adult after high school, Hannah was extremely fit, excelling at CrossFit, which was something that she absolutely loved. In 2008, when Hannah was 20 years old, she met 31-year-old Rowan Baxter. She actually met him at PCYC because his son was in one of her classes. After meeting, Rowan actually started working at the PCYC as well, teaching boxing classes. Now, Rowan Baxter was born on May 9th, 1977 in New Zealand. Growing up, Rowan was also known to be athletic, playing rugby with the New Zealand Warriors. When Rowan was 18 years old, he met his first wife, who is only identified in court documents as PP. He and his wife went on to have their son, who was the same son that was in Hannah's trampoline class. Rowan and his first wife originally lived in New Zealand, 
but by 2007, the family moved to Australia. Now, when Rowan first met Hannah, Hannah was living at home with her parents while Rowan was still living with his wife, but the two had been having marital issues that I'll discuss in just a few minutes. So even though he was still living with his first wife, he and Hannah started their relationship shortly after meeting. After this relationship started, Rowan and his wife had an amicable breakup and set up a plan for how they were going to parent their son. During this time, Hannah did know that Rowan was living with his ex-wife. Rowan told Hannah that it was for the sake of their son, but it was actually because he just couldn't afford to move out on his own. Four months into the relationship though, Rowan did move out of the home that he shared with his ex and moved in with a friend. Then, six months into the relationship, Hannah actually became pregnant. At that time, Hannah was excited. She wanted to have that baby. But Rowan told her that he wasn't ready and told Hannah that she was too young. So, she did end up getting an abortion. After this, Hannah and Rowan ended up moving in together in a townhouse in Mansfield. Hannah started working full-time at a shoe shop while Rowan worked as a sales rep for a pharmaceutical company. Six months after getting their townhouse, ultimately, the couple purchased their own home, now moving to Chandler. Then, by October of 2012, Rowan and Hannah were married. Shortly after starting their marriage, on April 10th, 2013, Hannah and Rowan welcomed their first daughter, Aaliyah Baxter, into the world. Aaliyah was described as being a sweet, articulate, clever, well-behaved little girl who did exceedingly well in school. Her favorite subjects were reading and English. Two years later, on March 19th, 2015, Hannah gave birth to her second daughter, Leanna. Leanna was described as loving to please people and making sure they were happy. Anytime her father was in a bad mood, she would crawl into his lap and give him a little cuddle to make him feel better. Finally, by December 4th, 2016, the couple welcomed their first son, Trey Baxter. Trey was the epitome of the baby of the family. He was high energy, loved running and jumping around, and he was absolutely obsessed with his mommy. Now, while the couple were starting their family, they were also in the process of opening up their own gym. Hannah asked her parents to invest in the gym, so they contributed $18,000, while another donor invested $40,000. From January of 2015 through December of 2019, I believe they opened two different gyms, with their first one closing down shortly after opening. Their second gym was called Integrate, and that gym did move locations a few times, but they managed to keep the doors open for a few years until the gym closed down in December of 2019. At the time, the couple still owed about $75,000 on the gym. By all accounts, those who went to the gym and knew the couple said that Hannah was the one running the place. She would greet people with a smile. She tried to create a warm, safe, accepting environment for every patron. She took classes to better her understanding of business and how to keep things operating. Meanwhile, Rowan was a lot less hands-on. He didn't have a great understanding of business, but he didn't do much to better himself. He mishandled their money, which ultimately led to the gym closing down. However, you all know by now that I wouldn't be covering this case if they were just a healthy, happy family unit that maybe had their issues with opening up their own business, but they got through it together. It turned out that all throughout the relationship between Hannah and Rowan, Rowan was very controlling and emotionally abusive, lashing out at times and also causing her physical harm. Now, of course, the abuse and manipulation started off very slowly and escalated over time. It started off with him controlling what she wore and who she spent her time with. When Hannah and Rowan first got together, Hannah went on a cruise with a friend. This upset Rowan, who told Hannah that he didn't want her to go, even though it had already been planned before he even met her. She went anyways, but all throughout the cruise, he was constantly calling and texting her, making sure she was checking in with him constantly. After the two started living together, Rowan told Hannah that she couldn't wear shorts. She couldn't wear short skirts or the color pink because he thought the color pink was too childish. Can't imagine what he would think about me. He would also allow her to wear a bikini if they were going somewhere more private, maybe a friend's pool, 
but she wasn't allowed to wear one at the beach or in public. At some point, he started calling her a fat pig to make her feel bad about herself. The two also had a shared Facebook account because Hannah was not allowed to have her own. So again, all this to show he did everything in his power to control what she looked like and if she did start feeling confident or wanting to wear things that made her feel good about herself, he would try to tear her down as much as possible. Then Rowan started to push a wedge between Hannah and her family in an effort to isolate her from everyone she loved. He would constantly badmouth her mother right in front of her. There was one time where Rowan actually borrowed Hannah's brother's car for an extended period of time, but he was incredibly disrespectful about it. He put over 30,000 kilometers on the car. He never changed the oil or filled up the gas tank. If there was ever a maintenance issue, Rowan never paid to have them fixed. It got to the point where Hannah's brother no longer allowed Rowan to drive the car, so Rowan stopped communicating with him and went out of his way to make it as hard as possible for Hannah to talk to him as well. On Mother's Day, Hannah wasn't allowed to spend the full day with her own mother. She could only see her for a few hours and then had to spend the rest of the time with Rowan, celebrating his mother, who was deceased. Hannah's family would also hold a celebration on Good Friday before Easter, but Rowan wouldn't let her go to that either. Then, outside of the holidays, Hannah's family also held a weekly barbecue where the whole family would get together at Hannah's parents' house to spend time together. Rowan also stopped Hannah from attending that. After each of Hannah's children were born, Hannah's mother, Susanna, would offer to help look after them. That's a very important thing that a grandmother can do to help take the load off of the mother who just had a child, but Rowan wouldn't allow her to see them. He also would be openly rude to Susanna, but then he would expect her to apologize. Hannah would constantly be asking her mom to apologize to him because if she didn't, Rowan would refuse to talk to her or let Hannah talk to her. She really just wanted to keep the peace within the family, but Rowan made that as hard as possible. Friends who knew Hannah and Rowan described that Rowan was controlling and possessive over many aspects of his life. He was jealous over others' success. He was incredibly insecure, but would put on a macho guy front for others. He was very concerned with his image and how people saw him, with friends saying that he loved when people were impressed or intimidated by him. As we will see in a few minutes, he also lacked self-awareness so badly that he would tell his friends about things that he did in his relationship to control and manipulate Hannah, and he would think that it's perfectly okay. But anytime a friend would say something like, that's actually not cool, he would suddenly turn it around and make it seem like Hannah was actually hurting him to make it seem like he was the victim. By December of 2016, after Trey was born and the couple now had three children to raise, Rowan would work at the gym they owned three days a week and would just rest and do nothing the remaining four days. Meanwhile, Hannah worked out every day. She was taking a marketing course online to learn how to be a better businesswoman. She also worked at the gym multiple days per week, all while taking care of her three children. Even through all that, with Hannah trying to keep herself in good shape, doing all of the work to raise the kids and trying to keep their business afloat, Rowan would constantly criticize her. He called the house a pigsty. He would ask her what she even did all day, saying that she clearly isn't working or taking care of the home. Eventually, Rowan told Hannah that she needed to get a second job, so she started working at the shoe store again two days a week while working at the gym the other days. On top of having two jobs, raising her three kids by herself, working out, and taking care of the business, Rowan also expected Hannah to have sex with him whenever he wanted. If she ever dared to say no, it would either spark a massive fight or he would simply go days at a time without speaking to her. Even with this, Hannah wasn't the only one dealing with Rowan's behaviors. Every Sunday after a morning workout, the family would always have breakfast together with one of the friends who went to their gym. Well, if he was mad at Hannah for whatever reason, 
he wouldn't allow his kids or Hannah to attend the breakfasts. There were many times where the family would have their normal plans, or Rowan or Hannah would plan something for the whole family. But if Hannah ever made Rowan mad for whatever reason, the children wouldn't be allowed to go anymore. At the house, if their kids didn't pick up their toys fast enough, Rowan would throw them away. These were all things that Rowan did to control every aspect of the lives of everyone around him. In mid-2019, Rowan's behaviors started to escalate further and further. On May 18th of that year, Rowan demanded that Hannah have sex with him, but she didn't want to. She was probably exhausted from everything she was expected to do. So the two got into a massive fight, which resulted in Rowan smashing her watch and leaving the home. At that time, Hannah found that the hose was missing from the house, so she called her parents in a panic, worried that Rowan was going to kill himself with the hose. Her parents ended up driving all around the town all morning looking for him, but they couldn't find him. Later that morning, Rowan finally came home and told Hannah that he had driven himself to the church and tried to kill himself. He probably didn't actually, he probably was just trying to make her feel bad for him. By November of 2019, Hannah had qualified to compete in a big CrossFit competition in a team. There were two other friends at the gym who qualified, so Hannah asked them to be on her team. Rowan said that he wanted to be the fourth member of the team, so Hannah agreed. I want to note that Rowan did not actually qualify himself to be in the competition. It was only because he was with Hannah, who did qualify, that he was even able to be on a team. However, after initially agreeing to be on the team, Rowan pulled out apparently due to an injury. But even though Hannah was perfectly healthy and excited to compete, this was something she really wanted to do. Rowan expected her to pull herself out as well just because he couldn't be on the team. Of course, she didn't, but this just infuriated Rowan. The first day of the competition was set to begin on November 8th, 2019. That morning, Rowan made Hannah do an exercise class at their gym, probably to be more tired and perform worse at the competition. But after that workout class, she got home at 7 a.m. only to find that Rowan and the children were all gone from the home and Rowan's phone was off so there was no way to contact him or know where the children were. She immediately called her mom hysterically crying because she knew immediately that Rowan was punishing her for taking part in the competition. The whole ordeal made Hannah so scared that she started throwing up and asking her brother to look around the area to see if he could find Rowan and the kids. Eventually, later that day, Rowan finally sent Hannah a text saying that he just couldn't believe that she would dare to be in the competition without him. At that time, he still wouldn't tell her exactly where he was and refused to bring the children home. That night, he finally returned home with the kids, saying that he took them to the beach. As this was happening, there were multiple times where Rowan would somehow hear conversations that Hannah was having while he wasn't there. In one instance, he told a friend that Hannah was upset with him for something he did in a workout class and was venting to a friend about it. Well, he told the friend that their daughter accidentally recorded the conversation and accidentally sent it to him. Very likely story. Well, during the whole incident of him taking the kids to the beach, there was also an old phone left in the home which recorded Hannah as she cried, freaked out, and called her mother. Of course, while in this state of panic, Hannah said things about Rowan that weren't so nice. I mean, why would she have anything nice to say in that moment? But of course, Rowan heard everything and was telling a friend about the whole thing, how Hannah was calling him names and talking about him to her mother. To this, the friend actually told him that it's not cool to be recording people without their knowledge or consent, and he told the friend that it was actually just another accident. He accidentally left the phone at home and somehow it accidentally recorded everything without his knowledge and he accidentally listened to all of it. Crazy stuff. These phones just be having minds of their own. Of course, it's thought that Rowan placed a recording device within the home and in Hannah's car because he somehow always had knowledge of all of these different conversations Hannah was having when he wasn't there. After this whole ordeal with the competition and Rowan throwing a hissy fit that she was still competing, which by the way, she did compete and made it to finals, 
but she told Rowan that how he treated her during that was the final straw. She said that there would be no more conversations that she wanted to leave because not only was he throwing that hissy fit, but he went out of his way to make her perform as bad as possible. He took away her children and tried to make it so that she couldn't concentrate. He made her do other workout classes so that she would be tired. At the same time, Hannah started confiding in friends about what was happening. She told friends that she was worried that he was recording her and had a tracker on her phone. She told the friend that she was just keeping her head down at home and was trying not to cause any more fights until she could leave. But it didn't matter what Hannah did because Rowan was going to find a way to get mad at Hannah, even though she was literally walking on eggshells. One night, Hannah woke up to Rowan going through her phone while she was sleeping. She asked him what he was doing and he immediately threw the phone across the room, breaking the screen. He went absolutely ballistic, asking her why she was calling and talking to certain people. One of those people was a male friend at the gym who was on her CrossFit team. The two had talked on the phone, probably having something to do with the competition, but logic wasn't Rowan's strong suit. So immediately, he accused Hannah of having an affair and just went nuts yelling and screaming about it. As all of these things continued to happen, Hannah was confiding in friends saying that if anything happened to her to make sure that the children were taken into loving homes. She would say that she didn't think Rowan would ever hurt the kids, but she was terrified of what he was going to do to her. Finally, in early December of 2019, Hannah started to prepare to leave the home with the kids. On December 5th, Nicole, Hannah's best friend, informed Suzanne that Hannah was in the process of moving out and that she would be returning home soon. Hannah pulled Aaliyah out of school and only packed a few things from her home that she shared with Rowan because she was too scared to spend too much time in the home to pack. She didn't want Rowan to know she was leaving until she was already gone. Hannah actually hid her car somewhere and left her phone inside, afraid that Rowan would be tracking her and find out she was leaving. By December 6th, Hannah and her three children arrived to her parents' home. That same day, Hannah changed her phone number and got a new phone to avoid Rowan being able to track and harass her. She also visited the local police department to inquire about what she should do about Rowan, citing his obsessive and abusive behaviors that he has shown for the prior months and years. The officer on her case, Senior Constable Kristen Kent, suggested taking out an order of protection against him, but Hannah was afraid to do that at that time, saying that she was afraid of how he would react. At the same time, Constable Kent contacted the Vulnerable Persons Unit to discuss Hannah's case and what action should be taken. Over the days that followed Hannah moving out, Rowan continued contacting her on her old phone, telling her that she was hurting the kids and asking to see her. The two did see each other during a morning workout class, and they also got dinner together to talk. Rowan came to Hannah's parents' house after that dinner and was crying to her and her family, saying that Hannah is hurting the kids and asking that she come home with him. After a few days of being away and Rowan continuously begging to see the kids, Hannah finally agreed to come back to the home that they once shared together to have dinner. This time, she did bring the kids with her. By 8.30 p.m. that night, Suzanne realized that she hadn't heard from Hannah in a while, so she texted her to make sure things were okay. It was at that time that Hannah asked her mom to come over to help. Turns out, Rowan was putting the kids to bed in his bedroom and was refusing to let them leave. When Suzanne and Lloyd arrived, Hannah told them that Rowan was not letting the kids leave, and Rowan told them that Hannah was being crazy and was making things up. He then started crying and saying that he just wants the kids with him for one night. Finally, the Clarks agreed to let them stay the night, so Hannah, Suzanne, and Lloyd went back home. That night, Hannah was worried all night about the children's safety. She had no idea what Rowan was capable of at that point. Thankfully, that next morning, Rowan did return the kids home. At that time, he told Hannah that he had a mental health assessment and was getting help for his problems. 
He said that he just can't understand why Hannah won't come home, seeing as how he is working to improve himself, so she should just return back. Over the course of the following weeks, Hannah did agree to let Rowan continue seeing the kids. She let him take them to his home overnight on a few different occasions, but as time went on and Hannah felt more comfortable with this arrangement, Rowan got more and more difficult to deal with. He would bring the kids home way later than he was supposed to, making Hannah worried sick every single time they would be late. The kids would come home upset. The children were stressed with everything that was happening, and their oldest, Aaliyah, knew that Rowan was behaving inappropriately and erratically. There was one time where Aaliyah even stood up to her father, telling him never to come back to their home after watching him scream at their mother. There were other times where Hannah would FaceTime Rowan so that he could see and talk to his kids, but sometimes Aaliyah would just walk away and refuse to talk on the phone. Those who knew Aaliyah said that she was very mature for her age. Even though she was only six years old, she saw very clearly how Rowan treated Hannah and she didn't like it. So she stood up to him because she wasn't just going to sit by and let it happen. What a brave, strong little girl. By December 22nd, Rowan contacted the Social Security office and tried to get payments saying that he was taking care of the children full time, but when they contacted Hannah, they found out that the kids were actually staying with her. On Christmas, Rowan begged to spend time with the kids, so Hannah's family reluctantly let him spend the day at their home. For Christmas, he gave the kids gift cards, but when they went to use them, they realized that there was no money on them. The following day, on December 26th, Rowan asked Hannah if he could take the kids to the local park so that they could ride the skateboards that they got for Christmas. Hannah agreed, so they all went. After playing at the park, though, Rowan insisted on bringing the kids home with him. Hannah refused, so Rowan grabbed their second oldest, Leanna, and threw her in the car. He then drove off with her in the front seat, unrestrained, and left. As he was leaving, he said to Hannah, you caused all of this. It's your fault. Right after Rowan left with their daughter, Hannah happened to see a police officer nearby, so she flagged her down and let her know what just happened. Hannah was very clearly hysterical and upset, telling the officer through tears that Rowan took their daughter and wouldn't bring her back. The officer told Hannah that because there was no family court orders, they technically couldn't force Rowan to give her back. Hannah told the officer about his controlling and manipulative behaviors, saying that it only got worse when she left. She watched as the situation escalated in front of her eyes, so that's why she got more and more strict with letting him see the kids. But of course, doing so just made Rowan angrier and angrier. I know, stuff. I know it's, it's frustrating. I know, it's stuff. his... I don't object to him actually seeing the kids. I just... What's his name? Rowan Baxter. Because he does this, he's fine for one minute and then the next minute... <laughs> Is it stemming from anything or is it just a separation? The fact that I, that I left, yeah. yeah. So there's been a lot of domestic violence, um, not physical but emotional, controlling, yeah. etc. for a long time and it just got too much. I just couldn't do it anymore. I've been speaking with um, Constable <laughs> at the Carina yeah, okay. station um, and we've been in talks of whether or not to get a DVO but I, th the only reason I didn't is because I was scared that it would antagonise the situation yeah. more yeah. and I thought that by keeping them with me would prevent something like this. <laughs> Yep. So after all of this happened, with Rowan taking Leanna and Hannah explaining to the officer the gravity of the situation, the officer attempted to call Rowan, but his phone was blocked to any unknown numbers, so they couldn't get a hold of him. Then they went to his home, but he wasn't there. The following day, Rowan FaceTimed Hannah to show their daughter, saying that she was fine, but in that conversation, he brought up the man again who he thought she was having an affair with. He told Hannah that he was not bringing Leanna home until she fixed that and ended the affair that she was not having. Over the days that followed, Rowan was contacted by Hannah's lawyer, and so he contacted his own lawyer. Both were advising him to return Leanna home immediately, but he started telling everyone that he was afraid of Hannah and what she would do once he saw her. By December 28th, Senior Constable Kent applied for a protection order against Rowan on Hannah's behalf. 
By December 29th, Rowan had returned home with Liana. For the prior three days, he had actually been staying with a friend so that nobody would be able to locate him. But once he finally returned home, he was met with officers who served him with the protection order. The protection order stated that Rowan could not go within 100 meters of Hannah or their three children. When reading the order, he started hysterically crying, saying that he did nothing wrong. He said that Liana wanted to be with him and was holding her and physically preventing officers from taking her. But finally, they were able to get Liana back and returned her to Hannah. After this whole incident, the courts looked back into what happened to see if further investigation was warranted and if they needed to take any further actions. They said that no further action was necessary, that this was just a custody dispute between the two parents. Rowan did go to the courts to demand 50-50 custody, but at that time, it was denied and the protection order was upheld. Over the next month, Hannah and Rowan went back and forth in the court system to figure out what to do. By January 3rd, 2020, a new parenting plan was placed where the courts agreed that the children would live with their mother and got to see Rowan every second weekend of the month and then every other Thursday and Friday with exchanges happening at the Clark's home. They also ordered Rowan to pay $360 per month in child support. With this new arrangement, there were certain stipulations in place. He was not to have any contact with Hannah outside of these exchanges and FaceTime calls between the kids. He was also not to cause any harm to Hannah and not expose his children to domestic violence. After this arrangement was made, Rowan was allowed overnight visits with the children, but as you can expect, he didn't follow the order as he was supposed to. He would show up to the home on days he wasn't supposed to. He would drop the children off late. The kids would come home upset and would start crying when they knew it was time to see their father. Then, there was one time where Rowan was dropping off the kids and Hannah saw that Rowan had explicit photos of her printed out in his car. She grabbed them out of the car and as she was walking away, Rowan grabbed her wrist so hard that he sprained her wrist. This incident was reported to the police and of course, he denied assaulting her. He said that Hannah is actually the one who stole his property, so he requested an order of protection against her. But that didn't work, and after this incident, Hannah refused to do more drop-offs with Rowan because he physically harmed her. She did continue to do FaceTime calls so he could at least talk to his kids, but that was it. By February 4th, Rowan lost his gym as a personal trainer at the gym that he had been working at. This was because Hannah and some of her friends actually had memberships at that gym and they knew how abusive Rowan was and they didn't want them anywhere near her or them. And after hearing this, I almost think that Rowan probably got that job because he wanted to be close to Hannah, but Hannah and the friends threatened to end their memberships at that gym if he was working there. So, the gym let him go. After losing his job, Rowan was given an eviction notice for his home because obviously he was not paying the bills. As all of this was happening, he started to tell friends that he was losing everything. He lost Hannah, his kids, his job, and now he was losing his home. He called friends on multiple occasions, just crying and venting about the whole situation. During one of the scheduled FaceTime calls with the kids, he just sat there crying on the phone, not even speaking with his kids. Of course, as all of this was happening, Hannah and her family were worried. They knew how downhill everything was going for Rowan, so Hannah told multiple family members and friends that she knew if she was ever alone with Rowan, he would probably hurt her. She said to her mom, quote, when he kills me, he will be in jail, so who will look after the children? Beyond worrying about him killing her, she was also worried that he was going to kill himself. And these worries were absolutely valid because everything came to a head on February 19th, 2020. By 6.30 a.m. that day, Hannah went out to get coffee for herself and her mother before returning home. She then sat on the bed drinking the coffee while watching her mom get ready for work. The girls were in the bedroom playing while Trey was watching a dinosaur show on TV. Meanwhile, that morning, Rowan stopped at a local gas station filling up his car at 6.54 a.m. 
After that, he too went to a local coffee shop where he got his coffee and sat for the next hour. While there, a barista noticed that he had the Maps app open on his phone for quite some time. By 7.20 a.m., Suzanne left the home for work, kissing Hannah and her grandchildren goodbye. By 8 a.m., Rowan left the coffee shop and drove to Hannah's parents' home, probably knowing that Suzanne had left for work. He arrived there by 8.17 a.m. and parked his car across the street from the home. As that happened, Hannah was loading her kids into the car before getting in and starting the car to leave for the day. But as she was starting the car, she was terrified to see that Rowan opened the door on the passenger side of the car and sat in the passenger seat. He started screaming at her to drive while holding a gas container in his hands. By 8.25 a.m., a local man named Michael was out in his driveway of his home cleaning his car. At the time, he saw Hannah pull over and she was screaming, call the police, he's going to kill me, he poured petrol on me. In the car, Michael saw Hannah in the driver's seat with Rowan in the passenger seat. Hannah was trying to get out of the car, but Rowan was physically restraining her. But immediately after Hannah screamed out to her neighbor, the car burst into flames. As he saw that happen, Michael ran to the car and he honestly can't remember if he opened the door for Hannah or if she opened it herself. But regardless, he saw Hannah get out of the car and she was on fire fire. He started hosing her down and told her to roll on the grounds to stop the flames. Once the fire on Hannah was out, Michael ran over to the side of the car where he saw Rowan lying on the ground, also on fire. When he saw that, he also hosed Rowan off. According to Michael, at that time, the car was so engulfed in flames that he couldn't even tell that there were children in the car. He thought it was just Rowan and Hannah. After that, Michael ran back to his house and yelled to his daughter to call triple zero, which went through by 8.26 a.m. Michael continued to try and help, hosing off the car and trying to get the flames under control. At that time, another Good Samaritan turned onto the street and saw the car engulfed in flames, so she too stopped by to help. She saw Hannah lying on the ground and started spraying her with another hose as well. I guess there were two hoses at Michael's home, so she grabbed one and started spraying Hannah down. At that time, Hannah was lying on the grass and was still alive. She started telling the witness that she couldn't believe what Rowan had done. She said that she had in order a protection out against him. She explained that after Rowan poured petrol all over her, she noticed Michael outside washing his car and called out for help. But as she did that, Rowan dropped a lighter on them. Then she told the witness that her babies were still in the car and asked if anybody had gotten them out, which at that time, nobody had. More neighbors started to come out to try and help the situation. One woman brought out a fire extinguisher, spraying the car to try and stop the flames. As that was happening, the car started to roll backwards, so other neighbors grabbed pieces of wood to put behind the tires to stop the car. Then, in the chaos of everything, Rowan stood up. According to neighbors, he was very badly burnt and started walking around the car very aggressively. It was almost like Rowan was trying to stop the neighbors from putting the fire out. He would follow them aggressively anytime someone ran up and tried putting out the flames. Witnesses then watched as he dove into the burning car via the passenger seat and then came out again very quickly. That is when neighbors noticed that he grabbed a knife from the car. After seeing this, some of the neighbors fled because they were afraid of being hurt themselves. At this point, multiple neighbors had been burnt already from getting too close to the car while trying to extinguish the flames. Michael had actually been burnt so badly from trying to get Hannah out of the car that he suffered damage to his face and eyes and had to be hospitalized. Now, after Rowan grabbed the knife, another neighbor watched as he sat down at a nearby walking path with the knife clutched in his hand. The neighbor yelled at him to drop the knife and try to de-escalate, but then he kneeled and held the knife against his stomach and fell forward onto the knife, stabbing himself in the stomach. He then fell into the fetal position. Finally, as all of this was happening, which 
everything that I've been explaining to you happened within minutes, if not seconds. So all of this chaos was all happening at one time and officers finally started arriving on the scene. And as you can imagine by now, it was just complete chaos. Hannah was screaming about what Rowan did, saying that her babies were still in the car. She was screaming things like, why didn't I just stay in the car with him? And I didn't save my kids. I couldn't save my kids. They then found Rowan, who was badly burned and bleeding out from his stab wound. Finally, first responders were able to put the fire out, but unfortunately, once the fire was finally out, six-year-old Aaliyah, four-year-old Liana, and three-year-old Trey were all dead inside the car. They had all been horrifically burned so badly that none of them could be identified by looking at them. When officers went to help Hannah, she was also very severely burnt, but thankfully she was conscious and able to communicate. She told officers everything that I've told you up to this point about how Rowan jumped in the car suddenly, poured petrol on them, and set the car on fire. After that, they put Hannah on a stretcher and put her into the ambulance. At that time, Hannah told first responders, I hope he survives and rots in jail for the rest of his life. At the hospital, emergency staff worked on Hannah to see if there was any way that they could save her life. Turns out she had suffered full thickness burns to 80% of her body, which just is not survivable. By 5.40 p.m. that night, just hours after being set on fire, 33-year-old Hannah Clark died at the hospital. Now, going back to the scene, officers also tried talking to Rowan, but at that point, he had been so badly burned that he couldn't speak. Resuscitation efforts were also administered to Rowan, but he had actually stabbed himself through the heart, so he too was pronounced dead at the scene. So, to summarize everything, after putting his wife and children through years of abuse, Hannah finally decided to leave. She finally took the kids away and was doing what was best for herself and them. She finally was getting away from Rowan and was ready to fight for her kids in the courts no matter what it took. But it was Hannah's strength and resilience that drove Rowan crazy. He couldn't accept that he no longer had complete control over Hannah and the kids. So he decided that he was going to make everyone suffer in the end. A devastating morning for emergency services that rocked a quiet suburban street. The three little children didn't stand a chance. It's a horrific scene. Uh, it will be a horrific thing for emergency services, police, fire and ambulance to, to deal with in the coming days. The father has been identified as former New Zealand Warriors player Rowan Baxter. His children, Lena, Aliyah and Trey, aged six, four and three. And their mother, 31-year-old Hannah Baxter. Witnesses say she was heard screaming for help, shouting she'd been covered in petrol moments before the car burst into flames. She had severe burns to, um, to a significant part of her body. Um, uh, yeah, the, she was treated for those burns. Uh, we secured her airway on scene. Only alive because she was pulled from the driver's seat while still on fire. We did all we could, um, but it was confronting. A good Samaritan who desperately tried to help the family in the burning car is now in hospital with burns himself to his face and hands. Neighbours were visibly shaken by what they'd seen. A bit upset. Just sad, that's all. Shouldn't happen. It's horrible, really horrible. Investigators at the scene are also reeling from the tragedy. The charred wreck can be seen from the air. The explosion tore off a door panel and shattered the glass. I've seen some horrific scenes. This, this is up there with, with some of the best of them. It's a terrible thing to, to be presented with, uh, but uh, we'll work through it. All of the crews that attended have been stood down at another location. And offered counselling. The ABC has confirmed the couple was going through a bitter separation, although no formal custody application is with the family court. Rowan Baxter had a series of friends looking out for him as they were worried about his state of mind. It's a tragedy that's hard to fathom with videos like this. A dad playing with his beautiful children who not long ago was also posting happy snaps on his Facebook page. They were fitness trainers, business partners who had it all until their marriage fell apart. It's understood the children had been living with their mother. 
I'm Rowan. And I'm Hannah. And whether you're just getting started or whether you already have some experience, we would love to hear more about how we can help you improve your health and fitness journey. On the couple's former business website, 31-year-old Hannah describes herself as a passionate mum who represented Queensland in trampoline sports for four consecutive years and won medals at an international level. She'd also worked at the PCYC for seven years, teaching gym to five-year-olds. This video on Ms Baxter's Facebook page shows her two daughters playing at the gym. Her estranged husband, 42-year-old Rowan Baxter, described himself as a top fitness coach who once played professional NRL in New Zealand. On Instagram, a post from 2017 shows former Broncos star turned Australian rugby player Sam Fireday training with him. In recent weeks, Baxter's social media was awash with photos of him with his children, saying he loved and missed them. This video of three-year-old Trey falling asleep while getting his hair cut posted on the 18th of November last year. <laughs> Other videos were accompanied by the hashtags Daddy Daycare. After this horrific series of events, police did do an investigation to figure out what exactly happened. They found CCTV footage of Rowan going to the petrol station the day before the murder and filling the can. They also saw him purchasing zip ties, cleaning fluid, and three pieces of Kinder chocolate. Then, in his phone, they found a letter that Rowan wrote just before taking his life and the lives of his family. The letter reads in part, quote, Hannah, I have so much to say to you, but now that you're reading this, it's come too late. You have turned my life upside down so fast that it has destroyed me. Without you thinking of any implications of what you are doing or saying is just pure evil. I have done nothing but love and care for you and the children to the best of my ability. I wasn't perfect, but I certainly have not deserved what you are putting me through. Withholding my children has got to be the most inhumane acts anyone could ever do, especially when you know how much I love them. You put a DVO on me just to get laid on a back that was just disgraceful and especially what you have implied i've never deserved that and you know it i've never caused you domestic violence hannah hannah the game that you are playing is disgraceful and i'm ending it i'm not going to take it anymore hannah do you know how hard it is to go to bed every night without your children i wish you would have just tried i told the kids you loved them they will miss you i'm sure you have destroyed my life and I cannot move on. I hope all of this was worth it for you and your family. As you can clearly see, shortly before his death, he continued to blame Hannah for everything he put his family through. And I do want to note, again, I mentioned it earlier, but the domestic violence order that was taken out against Rowan actually was not anything that Hannah did. It was the police officer on Hannah's behalf, and the police officer explained that very clearly to Rowan, but he still blamed Hannah for it. After finding the letter, police would later say that it's clear that he had an inability to look outward. His deep insecurity has led him to feel the need to maintain his appearance that none of this is his fault. He needs others to believe that everything wrong in his life is not because of him, it's because of everybody except him. Police would go on to say that based on what they found, it appears that Rowan's original plan was to kidnap Hannah, probably read her this letter, and then burn her to death. Then he would take the kids, giving them the chocolate that he bought them, and they would live with him and be a happy family. But once Hannah turned to a bystander and asked for help, he turned to plan B which was to take everybody down with him. Looking back, there were friends of Rowan's who were on his side during the whole custody battle, but they have said that they now see him for what he really was. Anytime he cried on someone's shoulder, it wasn't because he was remorseful. It wasn't even because he was upset and needed someone to talk to. It was because he was trying to garner sympathy. He wanted people on his side just for the purpose of trying to make himself look better and make Hannah look worse. Meanwhile, witnesses to the incident, as well as first responders, friends, and family, are all astounded at Hannah's strength and courage in her last moments. The fact that she had been so badly burned but made it out of the car to tell everyone what happened, she fought for her kids until the very last moment. After all of this happened, there was an inquest done into the deaths to see if they could have been prevented. As we know, police were taking action in this case. 
The officers I mentioned did seem to care and they did seem to put effort in to keep Hannah and the kids safe. Many officers who spoke to the coroner holding the inquest said that they knew the gravity of Rowan's abuse just by talking to him. The way he was made it obvious that he was a master manipulator who lacked empathy and just used everybody around him. The inquest heard from friends, including Hannah's best friend, Nicole, who said that she went to the police numerous times to say that Rowan was going to kill her. The other friends echoed the same concerns. The inquest looked into the action taken by police, the reports made by friends and family members, and learned as much as they could about Rowan and the behaviors he exhibited. But after a nine-day hearing, the coroner stated, quote, I find it unlikely that any further actions taken by the police, service providers, friends, or family members could have stopped Baxter from ultimately executing his murderous plans. And as much as I want to say I disagree and I wish more could have been done, I don't know if there's much they could have done short of arresting him, which of course I wish they had done. I wish he could have been charged with kidnapping for the incident at the park. I wish he could have been charged with domestic violence, but everything was still so fresh and everything was still in the process process of investigation. It's not like Hannah was killed during an exchange because those were stopped once he sprained her wrist. It's not like he killed the kids during a court-ordered visit. He was ordered to stay away multiple times. There were legal orders in place to prevent him from seeing her or the kids, but he found a way to catch Hannah by surprise and kill her in a way that nobody could have expected. Obviously, the coroner was quite emotional today. It's, it's not every day you see someone in that position shed tears. It, it's got to be a horrific job. I, I don't envy her at all. The inquest was a guided tour through the hell Hannah Clark endured before her husband Rowan Baxter killed her and their three children. Six-year-old Aaliyah, four-year-old Leana and three-year-old Trey. One of the most chilling pieces of evidence, this vision of Baxter shopping at Bunnings for the murder weapons, cable ties and a jerry can which he later filled with petrol before ambushing his family. Uh, this is not my car. So no, no, but you're sorry. the driver, so I have to ask your yeah, driver's no, license. Sorry. It's you, my car. During the inquest, several videos were played, giving an insight into the monster Baxter was. Four months before the fatal fire, police body cam records a condescending Rowan Baxter blaming his wife because one of their cars was unregistered and police pulled them over. So I thought the, the rego I thought was due in October. Uh, that talk to me about it because it's your car. Unfortunately, we didn't see it for a long time. And um, looking back now, in hindsight, if only, yeah, we, we could have seen and got her out of this situation earlier. But it was always Rowan's way or the highway. Baxter's cruel and controlling behaviour was first revealed in this interview with Tracy, days after he murdered Hannah and the children. Yeah. The night before he killed them, she, he was on the phone to the children crying. And when he, she hung up, or the children hung up, she said to me, Mum, I feel so bad for him. Mm -hmm. And I said, don't, it's what he does. But she said, I just feel so bad. Yeah. And, and that was a pattern with him, wasn't it? It was, yes. He'd push it to a, uh, you know, a, a, an extreme degree and then he'd burst into tears. Oh, yeah. very much yeah. so. Very much so. He was very good at that, mm. of, of playing the victim himself. Yeah. That being said, however, the coroner did recommend further domestic violence training for officers. She recommends that the department enact a five-day training program for specialist domestic violence training. She also recommends more government programs for men's behavioral change programs in the prisons and in communities. I think that's actually a great idea. Instead of focusing too much on saying the women need to get out, they need to go to women's shelters, they need to be hidden, actually trying to get to the root of the problem, which is how some of these men are behaving, I think that's a great idea. As these inquests into murders like this continue, the coroner's office said that they hope to build a stronger police response and help to prevent more victims in the future. So with all of that being said, that is all of the information that I have on today's video. I know this is yet another devastating case that never should have happened. Those involved in this case truly feel like Rowan was a monster who simply wouldn't have stopped until he exerted every last bit of control possible. Not only did he take the lives of his ex-wife and children, but he refused to take any accountability for it. So, 
he took his own life. My heart absolutely goes out to Hannah, Aaliyah, Leana, and Trey. They didn't deserve any of this. What they had to witness and live through in their final moments must have been so terrifying, so painful, I can't even imagine. Such young children literally burning to death is something I simply cannot wrap my head around. But that is where I'm going to end today's video. You all heard my thoughts, so now I want to know what you all think. Do you think this could have been prevented? If so, how? What do you think of what everyone said about Rowan after his death? Do you think if more people called him out on his red flags that this could have been prevented? Or do you think it was inevitable that Rowan was going to lash out? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.